Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the nice introduction, Larissa, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Um, very much looking forward to discussing copyright, open access, and museum culture with you, and I look forward to your questions yeah, during all of the sessions and afterwards. So, as Larissa said, I am the Collections Manager at Europeana Foundation, and I'm speaking to you from Delft here in the Netherlands. And what I would like to do to open this morning's session is to zoom out a little bit and to focus on the big picture. So I would fundamentally like to suggest that open access is a important way and a tool for museums, libraries, archives and galleries to really connect with and power their mission as organizations. And my presentation this morning really has three main parts. First of all, we will look at museum missions. So we will look at what is your mission and see how open access may connect to that. We will also discuss what open means because there is often some ambiguity, uh, different definitions floating around. So I would like to introduce some clarity on that. We will look at the bigger picture of open glam around the world today. So what is the current picture of that and what's the Swedish context in relation to that? We will look at the opportunity that open data and open access presents for museums. So let's continue. Um, let's talk about the museum's mission. Uh, so there was a survey done uh, a few years ago in the UK where they brought together, they aggregated and analysed keywords from missions of museums, libraries, archives and galleries. And what you can see on this slide is a word cloud presentation of that. And if we look at it, we can see some quite common themes, words and values that are represented. For example, people is quite prominent, learning, history, enjoyment, understanding, collections, community, for example. And when we look at the missions of GLAMS in Sweden, in the UK, and actually all over the world, there's a very consistent sort of remix of these words, uh, usually about two or three hundred words, where a statement sums up what the values and what the key mission and intention is of institutions and that's fairly consistent in the cultural sector. If we accept this I would then like to ask you to self-reflect on how those missions connect to the copyright policies, the image rights and reproduction policies that museums operate, whether they are open sometimes semi-open or in fact completely closed and rights reserved we could say for public domain artworks. How does that image policy connect to that bigger mission of museums? Is it complementary or is it actually obstructive? Something to think about. Let's also clarify what open access means. Quite often you will hear people talk about free access when they are promoting their museums. Isn't it fantastic that you can access these collections for free? You see that in tweets, in posts, in press releases. To, to oversimplify this, we could say though that free access means, well, yes, I can see it. Hmm. Great. But it's not open access. Open access really means that I can use it. I can use it in a educational piece, I can use it in my curriculum, I can remix it for a creative artwork, I can post it online without worrying about copyright infringement. So free access is really not open access and I think it's important for us today and generally in our jobs and work to, to remember this. So let's go into a little bit more detail about what open access can mean and how it can be defined. In my research work I like to use what's called the open definition 
This was developed by the Open Knowledge International several years ago and they have a nice one sentence summary of open access and I will quote it here. Open means that anyone can freely access, use, modify and share for any purpose. Later today we will look at with Sophia more detail about copyright right statements and licenses. So I only put up on this slide the open definition compliant licenses and right statements. These are the tools that the open definition says are open access. You will see some familiar licenses, for example, CC BY SA, CC BY, the public domain mark and CC0 are also there. And you will note no known copyright, which is from the rightstatement.org. We will encounter these licenses and legal tools later this morning. Quite often you will hear people say, well, what about non-commercial or no derivative licenses, NC or ND for sure? Well, according to the open definition, and according to me, I'm sorry, that is not open access. Those are restrictive licenses which prevent many useful kinds of reuse around cultural heritage. For example, adding an image to illustrate a Wikipedia article or uploading it to Wikimedia Commons for that purpose. So non-commercial and no derivative licenses are not truly open access, I want to suggest. So what's the global picture right now open glam around the world. Well on this map you can see a simplified presentation of countries where open glam, open access policy in cultural heritage has been identified and recorded. You'll note I'm sure that there are quite a few countries, many parts, regions of the world where open access has not yet penetrated and I think that's something that we can reflect on in the cultural heritage sector to say that is open access primarily a Western or a, a European and North American practice and if that's true why is that and how can it be spread appropriately to other countries. The data behind that map comes from a major survey which Larissa mentioned in her kind introduction. I've been conducting for the last 18 months with Dr. Andrea Wallace of the University of Exeter, uh, my research partner. And the Open GLAM survey examines how GLAMs make open access data, whether digital objects, metadata, or text available for reuse. This is the current picture of Open GLAM in Sweden. And as you can see, it's quite a positive picture. There are dozens of open glam instances that we have recorded in Sweden and many of these institutions will be of course very fi familiar to you and perhaps you, you work for one of them. Which licenses and rights statements are open glams in Sweden using? Well here's the picture. You can see that the public domain mark is quite popular, it's well used almost 50% of open GLAM in Sweden comes with the public domain mark. You'll also see CC BY, CC0 and CC BY SA in action. So what we can conclude from this image is that the Creative Commons legal tools have been well used and are well taken up in Sweden. And there is also no known copyright, the rightstatement.org statement which I mentioned earlier that has also appeared in Sweden. One thing that I would like to illustrate with you is that open access scope is an important concept. The Open GLAM survey records instances of open access by GLAMs. Now these are often small in scale relating to perhaps a few hundred or a few thousand digital objects and they're often exceptions to a GLAM's overall policy and practice. Therefore, survey inclusion 
does not mean that AGLAM has a blanket or a universal open access policy. In the survey, open access scope indicates this. It shows whether AGLAM has released some or all of its eligible data on open access terms. So this is a detail, but it's a very important detail to understanding open GLAM in three dimensions. In summary, to echo George Orwell, we could say all open GLAM instances are equal, but some are more equal and perhaps more meaningful than others. Open access scope in Sweden looks like this. Around 60% of recorded instances of open access relate to some eligible data. So not everything, not all of the public domain works where there was never copyright or copyright has expired. And around 40% of institutions apply open access policy to all of their eligible data. And this is a moving picture. It will change over time as policies are adapted and as they mature. If we take in the entire Open GLAM survey, which currently has around 650 institutions around the world, this is the picture of open access scope. Relative to Sweden, it is more limited in that less than 30% of institutions have released all of their eligible data on open access terms. 70% have only some eligible data. So there is an opportunity for GLAMs, yes, in Sweden and also around the world to increase and to extend their open access policy to more of their public domain collections. Why is this important? Why does it matter? I would like to suggest that structured open data is a, a fantastic opportunity for museums, libraries, archives and galleries. And I want to share just two examples to inspire you. Structured open data really powers our daily lives, our interactions online with our smartphones, with browsers, in all kinds of way which perhaps we don't realize. Structured open data, for example, information in Wikidata, is powering, is generating information for many commercial tech services such as Google, Google Images, the Knowledge Graph. Voice services like Alexa and Siri also rely on Wikidata for running their services and providing relevant information. So structured open data here, I'm suggesting, is a, like a Swiss army knife. It is a incredibly powerful and multifunctional tool for our daily lives and connecting cultural heritage information to this ecosystem is a, a fantastic opportunity to make our collections more relevant. In the library sector, we can see some really interesting work around Wikidata. Uh, I would recommend, and it is linked here, following the work of Jason Evans at the National Library of Wales, who has been mapping manuscript metadata into Wikidata to understand and create a whole new network of related information inside their collection and also relating their collection to other collections and to the wider picture of library data. Jason's presentation on this called Wikidata in GLAMS How and Why has much more information if you're interested in reading it afterwards. Open GLAM so far has been presented as a copyright, as a legal, as perhaps a technical, a data related phenomenon. However, I'd like to suggest that we are moving towards what I'm calling Open Glam 2.0 quite quickly. And I want to mention one or two examples of what that includes. Open Glam can also be considered as a community, a group of shared spaces, mostly digital, sometimes physical, and a set of shared values. Ethics is an increasingly important part of Open Glam. For example, considering repatriation and avoiding exploitation of colonial, colonially connected objects through digitization is a current piece of work 
and here are linked uh, two articles, one from the Times by my colleague Andrea and her research partner Mathilde Pavis, and the other resource is linked to uh, Maori culture and heritage in New Zealand. So there are ethical considerations which we should bring to bear, we should think about and recognize when we're talking about open glam beyond a copyright, a legal and a technical understanding. I also recommend this paper uh, developed by the First Peoples in Australia and this is around how we can increase, enhance engagement with indigenous communities and the museums and galleries world. Many of these ideas are being summed up and collected in what we call the Open Glam Principles. Next year, probably in May 2020, there will be an updated declaration on what open access and cultural heritage means today. And I added a few links here for your reference and the opportunity is, a, is live now for you to get involved in sharing your ideas and reflecting on the revised set of Open Glam principles which will come next year. To keep in touch with all of these conversations, I usually recommend following Open Glam as a hashtag on Twitter. So to conclude, I'd like to suggest that open data empowers citizens to reuse content in creative and independent ways. Open data connects glam collections with the web and it enables many in creative and new partnerships, adding extra value to a museum's mission. I recommend that we use standardized tools and infrastructures wherever possible. Don't reinvent the wheel. And to conclude, please be open in your data, your thought, and your practice. So tuck, or thank you, and I look forward to your questions today, this morning, and afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.